And we're live. Welcome back, everyone, to a new episode of the Wheelie Podcast. I'm your host, Micah Toll, and I'm joined by Electrex publisher, Seth Weintraub. How's it going, Seth? I'm good-ish. Got COVID Ish? again. Oh, no. Oh, no, not okay. again. All right, well, I hope you're feeling well enough to uh, to join us on this podcast here. You don't have to yeah. get too close to anybody. Yeah, don't get too close to the microphone, I guess. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, we're glad to have you here because we have a lot of interesting stories and I don't think you're going to want to miss these. Let's see what we have in store for us today. We've got uh, a number of new electric bikes that have come out, models from Trek, uh, OptiBike in the US, Frey has a new e-bike, an Italian company called Fantex. So lots of new e-bikes to discuss, plus a few other interesting stories about e-bike kits, new electric motorcycles in the U.S., uh, a new sort of pod bike car thing, and uh, even a flying electric boat. And then I think we're going to finish it off with a fun little mini electric truck that I think would be difficult to really refer to as a truck. So uh, among all those, where are we going to start today, Seth? All right. Trek releases two new, more affordable electric bikes with hub motors, and hidden batteries. Yeah, so uh, affordable is kind of relative here. Like when you talk about Trek, you know, you're already talking about fairly high-priced bikes, um, usually in the three and a half to $4,000 starting, and then it goes up pretty quickly from there. But both of these models are priced at uh, $2,400. And so for Trek, that's a, a pretty low entry price for what's otherwise a very, um, you know, high-quality, high-end bike shop brand this isn't a you know a company that you just order online from a direct to consumer type of setup and so uh, these two bikes the way they've achieved this uh, lower price point is mostly by going with a uh, more simple uh, drivetrain so both of these have hub motors and uh, Seth and I were talking about this and I'm not sure that there's another e-bike in uh, Trex lineup right now that has hub motors outside of their like, you know, Electra brand and stuff. You know, Seth, you said that the, uh, a while ago, the old uh, Electrek model might've had one, right? Yeah, actually uh, we were talking to Trek a few years ago and they were like, Hey, did you know that we used to have a bike called the Electrek? Uh, obviously the name of the site and the, the podcast. And I was like, uh, no, like, am I going to get a cease and desist? And they're like, no, we, we gave up the brand a long time ago. Um, but uh, yeah, so they used to have a bunch of stuff. And I don't know, I, I think back way back then, this is like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I think uh, hub motors were the way to go. So I don't know if they, we'd have to go back and look that up um, to see uh, what kind of uh, drivetrain it had. But as of now, like the, you know, we were talking earlier, the the Verve is Trek's current or before this uh, low price bike. And they used to sell them for twenty three ninety nine. Same price. I think they've gone up in price, though. Uh, just they were Bosch uh, mid drives. Um, so, you know, this is this is uh, going to be like the new entry point, I think, in Trex lineup. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, anyone who's watching live, let us know in the comments if there's some Trek hub motorbike that we haven't seen yet. But uh, as far as we know, this is the new hub motor entry line in the the whole Trek model line here. And uh, there's actually two different styles of bikes here. The first is the Dual Sport Plus, and then the second is the FX Plus. The Dual Sport, like the name would imply, is a little more of a uh, sort of trail bike. It's got, you know, mountain bike-ish geometry. You're a little more pitched forward, but it's it's more of one of these sort of, um, you know, crossover, leisurely, rails-to-trail network kind of bikes. This isn't for doing any, you know, downhill routes, that kind of thing. And then there's the FX Plus that's, you know, a little more of that um, commuter style e-bike that comes with the rack and the fenders. And this is the one you're going to get if you're really looking to, you know, get to work and back or do some grocery shopping and you want to throw some pannier bags on there, that sort of thing. It's a little more for getting around town utility riding. But uh, both of these are, um, you know, pretty simple drivetrains, 250 watt hub motors, 250 watt hour batteries. Uh, the batteries are actually built into the frame. I don't even believe they're removable on these. Oh, which interesting. On the, yeah, on the one hand, it, it makes for you know a nice sleek design. You don't have a, a bulky removable battery. But on the other hand, you can't take it out if you want to charge it off the bike. Uh, if you want a spare battery, you know, if you want to double your range, you can't just swap it in from your backpack, that sort of thing. So pros and cons, but I'm guessing most people are going to see it as a con. Yeah, I mean, 
it's nice that it's built in. Um, you could, uh, you know, we, we were, we're always talking about like uh, battery tech and you could get one of those like Jackery uh, uh, batteries and just charge your bike from that and bring that up to your apartment every night or whatever and then just plug it in at your, you know, apartment bike rack, I guess. Uh, do we yeah, know what, what, what kind of... Do we know what kind of motor the the 250 watt hub is? Um, I'm not sure that they listed the uh, the manufacturer. I don't uh, I don't see it immediately here jumping out at me. Okay. Um, I think they probably wouldn't uh, wouldn't advertise which one they went with, especially if it's not you know like a Bosch name brand kind of thing. Right. Yeah. I wonder if it's actually 250 or if it's a little bit more. Um, yeah. I don't know. It seems like a pretty solid bike trek you know, obviously make some of the best bikes out there. So um, nice new entry point. Yeah for, the, yeah, for the price, I mean, I know in the comments, a lot of people were saying like, you know, a 250 watt bike, which like you said, might not really be 250 watts in 250 watt hours that, you know, two and a half thousand dollars don't, don't match those specs. But I think that too many people simplify e-bikes into like the the performance and the price. And there's so much more to it than that. It's not just, you know, how much power does it have? And that should equate to a, to a dollar price, you know, like there's some formula for it. There's, there's so much more going into this, the build quality, uh, the ability to go to a local bike shop and, you know, buy it there, have it serviced, even having four different frame sizes, you know, most of these direct to consumer e-bike companies, you get one size and it's like, well, just, you know, reach your legs out longer kind of thing. So there, there's a lot that goes into these. And I think that, you know, the price is it's certainly more than you'd pay for another e-bike that's direct to consumer with a 250 watt hour battery. But I think that you're getting more as well. I love, I love some of the comments like, why not just buy a motorcycle? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> it's not really the same thing at all. Uh, but yeah, I, I guess we should expect that by now. $2,400. What planet do you live on? Okay. All right. Uh, there, there's a lot of expectations here. But there is a good uh, comment here. Uh, a ride one up core five. That's is that the belt drive one? Uh, no, that's uh, their fairly entry level. Okay, um, so sort it of has, commuter bike has three times the power, so a seven hundred fifty watt motor, twice the battery, five hundred watt battery, half the price, and it's ten more pounds in weight. Uh, that is a pretty good comparison. Like if you look at it from that point of view. Um, but I don't think your bike shop's going to carry that, so or service it probably. So maybe maybe think of, think again. Right. Uh, yeah. Or so there's you know, trade offs. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Uh, new electric bike with massive battery claims to be able to climb Mount Everest on a single charge. So I love this one just because it is so excessive in like every single way. So this is called the uh, OptiBike R22 Everest. And they named it the Everest because it apparently is capable of climbing Mount Everest in the sense that on a single charge, it can do that amount of elevation gain, which I think is like 8,000 meters or like 22,000 feet level? or something like that. Um, so, that's or... a good question. Are you starting at base camp? Yeah. Or... <laughs> uh, I, I think it actually is from sea level, if I'm not mistaken, that like that's the the elevation gain that they say that it is capable okay. of. And uh, for anyone who doesn't measure their e-bike capacity in height, but rather in distance, that equates to something like 300 miles of range uh, when going at 15 miles an hour. Uh, I think most people that have this bike are not going to stick to 15 miles an hour, though, because it goes over 30 miles an hour. I think it's like 32, 35 miles an hour, something like that. Uh, the top speed when it's in its you know off-road mode to, to keep it legal. But this is just like excess in every way. It's got uh, two battery packs that uh, they're both removable from the sides of the frame and together they add up to 3,200 watt hours of capacity, wow. which is like six or seven times, you know, like a typical, you know, rad power bike battery or something like that. Yeah. So, you know, like just a ton of battery. It's uh, of course, you know, full suspension, mid drive. OptiBike has developed their own uh, proprietary mid drive motor, which, um, on some bikes that would like worry me a bit because you know there are already good solutions out there but OptiBike has been around perhaps longer than any other e-bike company in the US and they've been building their own motors for well over a decade maybe like uh I don't know 13 14 years something like that when I got into e-bikes in 
2010 or something like they were already an established company. So, um, you know, a smaller name, but they've been building e-bikes in Colorado for a while now, and, and they definitely know what they're doing. So, you know, I, I'm, I definitely think that the bike can do what they say it can do. It's just, I'm not sure anyone's going to be able to afford it because it's priced at $19,000. Yeah. So, that's, uh, that's the big, Oh, this is not in your yeah, price range. A, yeah, there's a little catch if you want to be able to climb Mount Everest on an e-bike. You're gonna to have to to pony up the the 19k to do it for sure. It's um, I mean the fact that you can do all this on this bike that you know it has the ability to climb. It's got the the massive torque. I think it's like um, it's 120 newton meters or something like that of of crazy torque. Uh, the the giant batteries. Um, oh, here's the speed: 36 miles an hour and 1700 watts. So you know super high performance. Um, also a roll off. I think it's a 14 speed internally geared hub. Oh, so wow. Like, everything is just, you know, top notch on this bike, but $19,000. Right. Yeah. So it's, if it's in the, if you have to ask, it's not for you, price range. Um, you know, I do like the batteries that that's kind of interesting to me. Um, is this a cooling? Like, uh, if you look at the sides, there's like, a you know, something similar to what we see on some motorcycles. Um, do you think this is like a cooling motor or cooling battery? Yeah. I mean, they look like uh, exactly like on the side of pistons, almost those cooling fins. Uh -huh. I don't know if it's as functional because also to me, that looks like plastic. So I, okay. I don't know how well it would work as cooling. I think maybe it's sort of, um, you know, form follows function kind of thing or something that it's, it looks more like what, uh, you'd expect those cooling fins to be, but perhaps it adds a little bit of cooling as well. And so this obviously is kind of riding the line between bike and motorcycle. Is there, does this have a throttle? It actually does have a throttle. So okay. uh, if you want to be able to make use of the higher speeds without pedaling, you can do that. It's got a half twist, but um, you know, above 20 miles an hour, it's technically not within uh, e-bike law. If you're using, the throttle, you know, it's got to be a uh, throttle only up to like 28 to be a class three e-bike. And I, I imagine that you can limit it, you know, if you want to ensure that you stick to the letter of the law while you're riding in a bike lane or something, but with a bike like this, it'd be a shame to only ride it in the bike lane. Yeah. This would kind of almost look silly in the bike lane. It does look like it's like morphing into a motorcycle at this point. <laughs> um, especially with the 36 mile per hour top speed. Um, also like that brake looks comically large. Uh, the front brake is that like, I don't know, 360 uh, millimeter. What is that? Yeah, it's like a frisbee. That thing. Yeah. Do we know what size that is? Because the back one looks normalish. Yeah, I don't have uh, I don't have that in front of me. There's okay. 200 millimeters of travel in the fork, and it looks even bigger than those uh, stanchions in the fork. So right. I'd say it's over a 200 millimeter brake. But past that, I, I don't have the exact figures. But you're right, that does look massive. And I think it, you know, it sort of matches the whole overlanding aspect of this bike that it's not even like for riding trails. It's like when the trails end, you can keep going on this thing. I mean, it's the, the double crown fork, the, um, the triple headlights. Uh, it looks like it has a dropper post perhaps. I mean, this thing is, is really it, built. It just for, has literally everything. Yeah. And this is like, if you took one of those Jeeps that's actually designed for going off road and turn it into a two, two wheeler, this is what it would be. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm seeing some good questions in the comments. Like, uh, the roll off IGH gearbox can hold up under 1700 watts of power. Is that are those rated high enough for that? You know, I'm not sure, but if anyone's going to build a hub that can do it, it would probably be roll off because you know they're they're very highly engineered. So, and if OptiBike is using them, I think they would have you know found that that they couldn't hold up to it by now because. Uh, OptiBike has been building high power e-bikes for a while. And, and if they're using the parts, then they must, you know, they must have found that they pass muster. Either that or they're going to be a lot of warranty claims soon. Yeah. And of course, uh, somebody's saying exactly what I was thinking is uh, the cable management. Oh, uh, no, I was saying a $5,000 bike uh, could be made into something like this. You know, like for instance, <clears throat> I'm, I'm playing around with the uh, Luna. Um, X2 right now, which has a uh, overclocked or over over amped uh, BBHSD or 
whatever uh Bafang motor. And like you could build a bike with a bigger battery, with a big battery, and a lot of this stuff for a lot less money. But I think putting it all together in a package like this, kind of and and also like for the the market that has eighteen thousand dollars to spend on a bike or nineteen thousand dollars to spend on a bike. Like, of course, yes, you could build one cheaper, but it's not going to be as good at, as tight a package. And, you know, frankly, people who are spending this much money on a bike, they don't really want to build one themselves. So. Exactly. Yeah. This is for someone who just wants a ready to go package that can start, you know, tearing it up immediately. Right. All right. Moving on. Uh, this 28 mile per hour Italian electric bike offers dual batteries on an eye popping truss frame. So someone who speaks Italian will have to tell me if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but I believe it's the Fantic Isimo. Um, and this is just, it's probably one of my favorite e-bike frames right now, just because it's so innovative looking. Uh, it's got this truss style frame. And if anyone remembers that we covered a Yamaha e-bike a couple of months ago that had a similar looking frame, it's because Yamaha partnered with Fantic and basically was able to use this really cool frame. So the Isimo, it has this step-through frame that looks almost like a you know, like trusses that you'd find in like a roof or something. And it creates uh, this really cool sort of see-through frame that they have uh, these interesting colored panels you can customize it with. Basically, they, they've done some really cool design here that, that makes it different than almost any other e-bike on the road. But the, uh, you know, the looks are one thing, but of course, what's probably more important for a lot of people is the performance. And so as a speed pedelec in Europe, this is a 45 kilometer per hour or 28 mile per hour e-bike. It's, you know, technically we, we call it an e-bike, but it's, it's technically a, uh, a speed pedelec and thus like a moped class vehicle in Europe. So that means that anyone who buys one of these is going to have to register it. They'll get one of those like cute little license plates that go on the back of mopeds. And uh, technically you won't be able to ride it in a bike lane, but you can, you know, use it on the road anywhere that you know, motorcycles and mopeds are allowed. In practice, I think a lot of people in Europe still ride these in the bike lanes. They just go a bit slower and, you know, try not to be jerks about it. But um, technically, this is like a moped class vehicle in Europe. It uses the uh, Bafang M600 motor, which is about 120 newton meters of torque. It's not like the craziest of the Bafang motors, but it's it's one beneath it. So it's still pretty darn powerful. It's, it's listed as 500 watts, but we all know it puts out at least a thousand watts of, of real power. And then it's uh, tied into an Enviolo uh, heavy duty continuously variable transmission. So you got that nice, um, you know, sort of like infinite gears within, I think it's like a 380% gear range. So um, some pretty nice parts on this bike, get those uh, four inch uh, wide, 20 inch fat tires. And, you know, otherwise just a, a very nice sort of urban moped style bike, which, you know, in the U S we'd call this like a moped e-bike, but in Europe it's, it's really a moped and that it's, it's not even an, an electric bicycle anymore. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I would say hats off to Fantic cause I just really love the design and it's great to see something so unique like this, especially in a, an industry that does a lot of rehashing of the same designs. Yeah. I mean, the, the, Frame design is cool, but also like, uh, you know, most of the uh, 20 inch fat tire bikes have rear hub motors. So it's interesting to see, for me, to see um, a Bafang mid drive uh, fat tire e bike. Um, obviously, the frame's super cool. Um, I, I don't know about this model wearing high heels uh, with the, with the uh, pedal assist, but um, I'm assuming it has a throttle as well. I. I'm not sure if it has a throttle or not. It's a good question. Um, okay. I believe, I think they are allowed to, uh, oh, you know what? This model does have a hand throttle. I see it here. Yeah. So you, you are allowed to have a hand throttle if it's a speed pedelec in Europe. Uh, that's one of the advantages um, yeah. that you, you get that right when you have to register it. So uh, she could be throttling instead of uh, pedaling. With but, the high uh, it leaves a very, uh, it's both high fashion and high motorcycle culture. So right. maybe she's rocking both of those. Yeah. I mean, with the leather jacket, I don't know how much pedaling you're going to, how much sweat you're going to work up. Um, that is a, it is a cool bike. Is this coming to the U.S.? I know that Fantic is aggressively expanding. I'm not sure if this model is coming to the U.S. 
yet or not, but I would not be surprised to see it at some point because okay. uh, the last time I talked to those guys was the Milan motorcycle show and they were expanding all over the place. So fingers crossed that it will eventually come to the US. And are you going to be able to buy like accessorize your the color of the sides of the bike? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm sure that factors you know heavily into their profit margin because all that accessory stuff is is where a lot of these profits lie for companies. So, uh, you know, I think they're going to send all those things, um, you know, to, to all their markets because that's a real cool feature of this bike is that, you know, maybe they only have like two or three frame colors but you can turn it into any color bike you want with the accessories that's cool all right uh moving on we're going to talk about the fray runner electric bike with hub motor launched as the e-mountain bike brand's first touring bike yeah so anyone who who knows about fray knows that this is a uh high-end but sort of affordable for a high-end e-bike company they're based in Jinhua, china and so you're not paying for, you know, European manufacturing or European marketing, but you're getting e-bikes that actually compete well against European electric mountain bikes. So on their higher end bikes, you're talking about four or five thousand dollar bikes that compete against like eight, nine thousand dollar bikes. The Frey Runner here is one of their more affordable bikes. It starts at about twenty five hundred dollars, and it's not full suspension like most of Frey's bikes. It's a hardtail. And this one's meant really more for like, you know, light trail riding. It's, you know, sort of in a similar vein to the Trek bikes that we looked at, especially the dual sport uh, from earlier in this episode. And that it's, you know, it's not like a hardcore mountain bike, you know, it's still got the hub motor. So you got the, um, the heavier weight in the rear, but it has a nine speed um, derailleur there. I think it's the Shimano Alivio. So it's, um, you know, still pretty nice. It's not lower tier stuff. Um, but this isn't a full suspension bike. You're not going to be doing anything crazy though, because it's a fray bike, you could probably take it off some decent jumps. And, and that's really what a lot of these fray bikes are designed for is they're, they're built to be tough. Uh, last time I was at the factory and I went out with a group of riders, people were like, you know, jumping these things over my head, which I don't have the skills to do, but it was great to be able to see other people putting the, these fray bikes through such abuse and see what they hold up to. In this case, um, you know, I'm not sure this bike is going to be doing five, six foot jumps, but, you know, probably a two foot jump or so on this, it could handle just fine. And that says a lot for a bike that's really designed for, for trail usage. Um, in this case, the cool thing is that they've, they offer it with different motors for different markets. So while it does have a 250 watt hub motor option for Europe, if you're in the U S or Canada, you can get the 500 watt. And then, um, also for the U S you can get the thousand watt option. If you're going to be riding it, you know, quote unquote off-road only, though I think, you know, most people are going to be taking that into the bike lanes as well. Uh, whether that's legal or not in your area, you'll have to check, but it is nice that they offer, uh, these different motor options so that you can have either, you know, sort of a gentle 250 watt cruiser or a pretty powerful thousand watt climber. Other than that, it's just, you know, a nice collection of parts. There's a good, I think it's a rock shocks fork, um, hydraulic disc brakes, these are Tektro and not Magura, like we're used to seeing with uh, with Frey, though I imagine the Tektros are, are a little bit more affordable, but they're still good bikes. And so for this sort of touring trail bike setup, I think it's um, you know a nice balance and it gets you some good parts from a company that's known for making high quality bikes at a fairly reasonable price of about 2,500 bucks, you know, something that you're not going to be able to find from, from something um, stateside, you know, even those Trek bikes, you know, you're talking about you know, 750 more watts than those Trek bikes and uh, a lot more battery, a lot more speed up to 28 miles an hour for the same price. Yeah. The, the one downside of Frey is that it's kind of hard to get, get the bikes to ship to the U S I know they've improved that a little bit, but what's, what's this current status there? Yeah, definitely. So um, you're right. They, they ship directly from China from their factory and so it can be sometimes a few months of wait from the time you order a bike until it's built and then shipped to you. Um, they have done group buys in the past where um, they're able to ship more bikes for cheaper in, uh, in a big group. Um, that also sometimes helps expedite it. But they're currently looking for U.S. dealers. You know, they want to expand with um, sort of boots on the ground in the U.S., so that they have someone who can stock bikes and who can get bikes, you know, quickly to, 
um, to customers, especially sort of the the basic bikes that don't have a lot of uh, accessories or um, you know custom changes to them, custom paint colors, things that can be kept in stock here. So um, if they find somebody, it could mean that we can all get our fray bikes a lot quicker. Or if you've been wanting to get into the higher power, higher quality e-bike business, maybe you should talk to the uh, fray folks and and start up as a, uh, a fray dealer. What do you say, Seth? You want to be a fray dealer? I kind of do. Uh, it would like I, my days are pretty packed already, but it seems like a fun thing to do. Um, but you do have to deal with the end users who may not be as uh, savvy or forgiving as uh, you know a typical uh, e-bike owner. Um, I have a Frey CC, and I I love that bike, but um, I think it's a little bit overpowered for for the the socket or the uh, the cassette in the back. So um, this one is kind of nice that you don't have to think about that because the uh, the power is actually coming from the um, the hub motor in the back. So if if a overpowered mid drive is something that concerns you. I think it's nice to have an option of a a, a rear uh, hub motor. Yeah, it's always been sort of a the one big advantage to me for hub motors is the redundancy. You know, like if you break a chain, you can get home just on throttle, or if somehow your your battery dies or your hub motor dies, you can pedal home. You got you know two independent power right. systems. Yeah, yeah, that is nice. Um, all right, so let's move on. Uh, switch. Uh, that's how you pronounce it, right? Yep. Switch. Uh, shows off first pocket sized electric bike battery for DIY e bike conversion kit. This one, I think, is awesome. It, I mean, it looks cool. They've got these like graphing calculator sized uh, batteries that you could literally fit into your pockets, maybe your cargo pockets, but still, like, this thing's maybe three inches wide and I don't know, seven, eight inches long. And it just uh, slaps right on the front of the bike. There's this cool clamp mechanism that holds it right in front of the handlebars. And that's your battery. Like there's no bolting on this, this bulky battery. There's no rack battery. Um, it just, it looks almost like um, some type of odd accessory bag or something that's up on the, the handlebars. And it's very slick looking. Uh, the rest of the kit is quite simple in comparison. You know, it's just a... Um, a simple hub motor. Um, I think the controller is built into the mount that holds the battery. And then, um, you know, there's a, a standard e-bike throttle for the people who live in countries that are allowed to have throttles, namely the U S and Canada. Um, anyone who's, uh, in Europe and buys this kit, unfortunately won't get the throttle. And there's a simple pedal assist sensor. So everything besides the battery is like standard, you know, basic Chinese bike parts, but it's the battery here. That's the really cool part. Um, and there's actually two sizes. There's the um, normal battery, and then there's the air, which is half the size. I think it's 180 and 90 watt hours for the two versions, which are pretty small. But if you're using this on pedal assist, uh, they say you'll still get, I think it's 15 kilometers per battery, which is uh, nine miles, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, you know, if you have the big battery that's 30 kilometers or, or 18 miles, and these are really meant as commuter, you know, around the city type of e-bike kits. It's not something you go out for like a super long ride. So I think for most people, either, you know, nine or 18 miles is probably going to be enough for, for city use. And, um, you know, to get such a cool, innovative looking kit, I think is, again, it's just nice to see this kind of innovation. It's also those cool colors, Seth, if you want, you can match your, your shirt of the day, That's that kind of thing. So important. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and you typically put this on like a, a Brompton kind of uh, you know city commuter foldable. Does this? I see some of these in the background. Does this also work with a, a regular size bike? Yeah. So their big thing is that they say it fits basically any bike, like as long as it has handlebars and some type of you know fork to hold the wheel, like a normal two sided mm -hmm. fork, not some fancy like lefty fork. Then it should fit. And in fact. They often bring a penny farthing to oh, right. the shows that they've electrified. Um, if anyone's not familiar, penny farthings are those like comical 150 year old or whatever bikes that have that giant like five foot front wheel and the little 12 inch rear wheel. Before yeah, they got one of these that they've 
Yeah. And so they've electrified one of these with their kit and uh, it's awesome. I can't believe I didn't grab a picture of it. I think I was so blown away by these cool little batteries that I forgot to, to snag a picture of the electric penny farthing bike. But you can, uh, to, to a long-winded answer to your question is yes, you can put on any bike. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so some opportunities here. It doesn't have like a USB port, so you can't like charge your phone from it, like when it's not being used as a bike thing. Yeah, I feel like that's a big oversight. You're right. It would have been so great for this to also be a power bank, not just because it looks like a power bank. Right. They could even put like a light on it and... Uh... That would have been a added bonus. I guess that's something for the next version. Yeah, I wonder if the logo lights up because I know their former battery that was like a bag style um, mm -hmm. actually had, I think, a light behind the logo in the front. So, you know, it was still like a B scene light. It's not going to, you know, show you where the potholes are, but at least cars see you coming kind of thing. And this thing could put out enough power. Like, what is it? What is the wattage output? They're rated at 250 watts. Again, it's like, you know, I don't know if that's true 250, but I don't think those bikes are putting out more than 400 peak. So it's a, a pretty, you know, lightweight, low power system. Uh, I used a previous switch kit, which I think the motor was the same. It's just a different battery. Mm -hmm. And uh, I put it on a, uh, a pedal assist bike and, you know, it was, it was plenty. I even took it off roading and, you know, with my assist as well, it did fine. And, like dirt and light sand. So it's, it's not a high power kit, but, um, you know, for, for normal city use, as long as you're not climbing San Francisco Hills, I think you'll be fine. Yeah, that's cool. And I guess one of the nice things is like, you don't have to use it. Like if you're, if you want to go a hundred percent pedal power, you just leave the battery at home and theoretically switch out the, the front motor or the, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Moving on. Exclusive uh, Rivid Anthem unveiled as revolutionary new affordable electric motorcycle in the U.S. This is perhaps the electric motorcycle that I am most excited for right now. Uh, this is essentially a commuter spec electric motorcycle. So we're talking 75 miles an hour, 75 mile range. Uh, it's sort of in the class of the Sondor's Metacycle, if anyone's familiar with, with that bike. Um, the difference is it seems like the guys behind this one are a little more organized. Uh, they they come from an, an interesting background as well. They're um, uh, some of them are, are automotive guys. Um, some of them worked for uh, Icon Aircraft, and uh, and they're all tech guys with sort of like motorcycle enthusiast backgrounds. So they bring in a lot of different tech experience as well as aerospace design, and you can actually see a lot of the sort of aerospace um, inspiration here. The, the whole frame is super lightweight. It's actually, instead of a tubular frame, it's folded stainless steel. So it's it's basically like a big box frame, almost like a, a monocoque chassis you could describe it as, I guess. And the whole thing weighs like um, 12 or 15 pounds for the entire frame, which is really? you know crazy for a, a motorcycle frame. Um, and then you can see uh, in some of the, the photos how... Um, the, uh, members that hold the, the seat there are kind of like Swiss cheese. They've got all those, um, holes, uh, cut out of them, which just re reduces even more weight, you know, places where you don't really need like, um, full thickness or full area in that metal. They've all oh, just yeah. been lightened as much as possible. And, uh, there's also some cool sort of shape shifting innovation here. The whole saddle can move four inches. So it changes from a 30 inch step over to a 34 inch step over or anywhere in between. If you're a long legged rider or, you know, you share it with uh, your wife who's got shorter legs, you can both use the same motorcycle and just adjust it each time you get on. And in fact, you can even adjust it on the fly because the actuator can lift a, a couple hundred pounds. So you can be on it and be like, you know, actually I want to, you know, have my legs stretched out a little more and just lift the seat up in the middle of the road. Or maybe like drop it on the highway for arrow or something. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's uh, it's really cool to have that that technology. I mean, it's something we've seen a little bit from companies that say they want to do it. Like, you know, Damon Motorcycles has been saying for three years that they're going to have a shape shifting motorcycle, but they don't have it out yet. Um, so it's cool to see another company that looks like they'll actually bring it to fruition here. Um, and then, uh, as you can see in that that battery there, if you're watching along with the uh, YouTube stream here. The, uh, the battery is actually removable, which is a cool feature if you live in an apartment um, or somewhere where you just don't have access to a plug on the ground level. And it's got built-in wheels. So 
Um, there's actually a really neat way to remove it. The uh, One of the founders, um, Dong Tran, uh, showed me over a, a Zoom call when he was showing me how the bike worked. And basically, it, it sort of fulcrums down onto the ground, and the wheels in the bottom of the battery contact the ground, then it just slips out. So the battery weighs like 60-something pounds, but you never actually have to support all that weight yourself because it just sort of like cantilevers down to the, the ground by itself. So, you know, even if you're not capable of just like picking up 65 pounds and carrying it, which would be, you know, rule out a lot of people carrying this up to their apartment, you just roll it up and even a moderately fit individual will be able to, you know, slide it in and out of the motorcycle, which is a, a pretty neat feature. Now, if you have a garage, you'll never need to do that. But for someone who doesn't have a, a place where they can plug in and charge, you can bring it upstairs and charge it in your apartment or office. So it does it like have a bar that comes out like a suitcase? Yeah, it has um, exactly like a like a rolling suitcase or a okay. trolley or something. It comes it. out and um, then you can roll it around. Yeah, hopefully you don't have stairs. Hopefully there's an elevator. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, at this point with everything being so ADA compliant, I think there will be some way to get it up to wherever you're headed. Yeah, no, that's it's a cool bike. And so uh, you mentioned that uh, a little bit more organized than other bike companies in the field. Um, we know that like. In this in this general area, there's Saunders, there's uh, Kelter, maybe uh, City. Um, what when when can I get one of these, and how much is it going to cost? So it looks like it's still going to be um, until quarter two of next year. But the the thing that I like about these guys is that they didn't just rush out as soon as they had a first prototype or renderings. Like they've been working on this in stealth for the last like nine or ten months at least, mm -hmm. and um, Finally, once they felt that they were ready to the point where they can show people what they've got and start taking pre-orders, which they'll open up next month, I believe, um, then they actually decided to go public with it. So, um, you know, and I, I respect that because it's it's not just like as soon as they have the first rendering, they want to start making pre-order money. Um, in terms of, you know, how much it actually costs, uh, it's going to start at $7,800, which is like, you know reasonable in the light electric motorcycle industry to put that in comparison right now the saunders metacycle is priced at it's either six or 6500 um though you're looking at probably at least a year for delivery on that one that's a, a whole other story that hopefully we'll have an update on soon uh and then on the higher end of the spectrum you get into um zeros entry models like the uh, fxe which costs i want to say like eleven and a half thousand and has only slightly better specs than this. Um, you know, this one goes 75 miles an hour and the FXE goes, I think, 85 miles an hour. So, um, you know, slightly more motorcycle, slightly bigger battery, but uh, significantly more expensive. So this is a nice gap filler for someone who needs a, an electric motorcycle that is fast enough to get on the interstate, but you're probably going to use mostly for suburban style commuting. Yeah, what are the specs on the motor on this one? I believe it's seven and a half kilowatt continuous okay. um, and then uh, 13 and a half kilowatt peak power. So, you know, again, sort of that reasonable mid range where it's, it's enough to get you going, but it, you're not going to like fly off the back of it kind of thing. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's great to have another entry in this field, especially as, you know, we've seen tons of uh, interest in Saunders and, you know, they're obviously not, uh, delivering as expected. Um, so maybe another, maybe some competition in the field will help. All right. Uh, let's move on a little bit. Uh, this 50 mile per hour fully enclosed electric vehicle offers car like convenience in a motorcycle size. Yeah. So this is the uh, Nimbus and it's it's a bummer if you're not watching the YouTube live stream because it's going to be tricky to <laughs> describe this thing. It's a tadpole trike, which means it's got two wheels in the front, one in the rear. It's a leaning vehicle, so it's not like a rigid trike, and it's fully enclosed. So imagine sort of like those uh, funny pod bikes where it's like a almost like a velomobile, except that you're really sitting up in a almost normal car-like seat. You know, you're not reclined like on a recumbent bike. And it, it effectively feels more like um, almost like a one seater car. There is a second little jump seat in the back. Um, if you had like, you know, a child or, or you wanted to put groceries or something back there, there's a bit of space. 
but really it's it's largely designed as sort of a one seater car like vehicle but because it's only got three wheels it's not actually a car it's um you know a motorcycle class vehicle uh and regulated under nhtsa's motorcycle uh safety regulations so it's you could call it a sort of enclosed motorcycle but it really drives more like a car in that sense and it's got um you know mid-level specs again so we're talking 50 miles an hour uh 90 something miles of range um, a pretty large nine kilowatt hour battery pack. So, um, wow. you know, this yeah. is not like a, a highway vehicle, but something that you could take in almost any suburban situation and is going to get you around for, for largely commuter type uses. And, and like we said, even with the uh, cargo space in the back, you could take this to the grocery store, um, maybe not the hardware store. I don't know where you're going to put two by fours in this, but, uh, you know, basic everyday kind <laughs> of uh, kind of chores. And I think, you know, 50 miles an hour, like for example, where you live, Seth, I don't think you'd ever need more than that to get around. Right. No, uh, actually it's probably a lot quicker than you would even need. Um, <laughs> but you know, yeah. I, I find it strange that, uh, it's got a steering wheel, but it's a leaning, like you'd be leaning with a steering wheel. To me, that's kind of weird. What do you think about that? So at first I thought the same thing, but what's interesting about the Nimbus here is that it's, even though it's a leaning vehicle, it's not like, um, you know, a bicycle or motorcycle in that you kind of control how hard it's leaning. It actually leans automatically based oh. on how hard it's turning. That's interesting. So in, yeah. In that way, it's like, you know, there's no rider skill that's needed, like in a, in a sort of manually leaning vehicle. So you don't have to think like, oh, this is a pretty sharp turn. I better lean pretty hard. You just keep turning the wheel and the thing leans as, as hard as it needs to turn. That's interesting. Yeah, it's kind of uh, like a boat almost in that it just, you know, or, or I guess a plane in that it, you know, it just leans the way it needs to to, to right. make however sharp a turn you're doing. That's that's interesting. I wonder if uh, seasoned motorcycle uh, owners would be like, why isn't it leaning? You know, like <laughs> they would they would want to control that and they, they wouldn't be able to control that. That's a super interesting uh, situation. So my understanding is they're in, california and they're giving some uh test drives and we're hoping like uh, maybe uh, scooter one of our colleagues uh at electric may have a chance to ride one in la in the ne next couple weeks so yeah that, I mean, that, that would be great because i think these things are so I mean, this is such a novel type of vehicle right like no one really knows what to expect of of something like this because it's it's not a car it's not a motorcycle it's not a bike it's not really like anything that that we know or think of as a urban transportation vehicle. And so uh, until we actually get people sitting in these things and, and hear what it's like, I mean, it's kind of this, um, you know, this big mystery of what it's like to be in one of these innovative pod style vehicles. Yeah. Uh, do we know anything about the aerodynamics? I mean, so one of the great things about these pod things is that they're usually much more aerodynamic than, you know, just an open face motorcycle or three wheeler. Is it, do we have any information on that? I don't think they've released uh, any like, you know, coefficient of drag or any, you know, like hard data on that. But uh, they've talked about just how much more efficient it is. They, they say it's like a third of the uh, energy usage of a uh, Model 3. So, I mean, part of that, it's, you know, how fast is it going, that sort of thing. But, right. you know, I, as far as I understand it, Teslas are pretty darn, um, you know, aerodynamic. So this this must favor you know or fare pretty well against a uh, a very aerodynamic tesla yeah it looks like it's a little tapered in the back as well maybe that helps all right uh that that's pretty cool i uh i look forward to hearing more about that one all right moving on uh candela c8 first flight i think uh, you might want to put quotes down uh testing the most <laughs> premium flying electric boat in the world so um you know people give me crap about the first flight thing but when you're in this electric boat, it really feels like you're flying. And that's the experience I had. I went to Stockholm recently to test out this boat. This is the second model from Candela. And it is just like, it's a wild experience because it's, it's a hydrofoil boat. So what it does is it actually rises up out of the water. The entire hull is like sitting out of the water dry while it's cruising along, uh, as long as you're going over, it's like, uh, I think it's like 12, 13 knots or something. So like 
uh, almost 15 miles an hour, something like that. And it, it's all computer controlled. So you just, you know, push the throttle, the thing rises up out of the water. Then you're effectively flying on those hydrofoils. And as you steer it, it's, I mean, it feels like you're in an airplane, like you're above the water. You don't hear water lapping against the hull. It's all super smooth. Um, even when you go over boat wakes, like there were these big ferries and there was even a cruise ship that came through while we were testing. And um, Michael, the guy that was, you know, taking me out on the boat was like, all right, so just like take it right behind that cruise ship. I was like, what are you crazy? <laughs> I mean, we're, we're like the size of a lifeboat on that cruise ship. He's like, no, no, it'll be fine. So we're going towards it and he's just like, speed up, like go, go full speed into this thing. So, I mean, I trust him and we did it and we just flew right over that big wake behind the, the cruise ship. And it's like, you know, the water was perfectly f flat. That's what it felt like. The hydrofoils just, you know, react to whatever the, the water is like. And you, you feel almost nothing. There's you know, like a slight bump. It's almost like, you know, if you're driving down the road and you go over like a pencil, it's like, oh, there's a little, little bump there. Okay. But other than that, you're not like bouncing like you would be on a typical V-hole boat. And so it's, it's just a, a wild new, new way to, I mean, I guess it's not new, right? Like hydrofoil boats have been around for a while, but electric hydrofoil boats are basically only in, I, I believe Candela is the only company producing these right now. And so this new boat is really going to take the sort of premium uh, boating market by storm in uh, Scandinavia, it's already outselling gas boats in its class. So it's like a 28, 29 foot um, luxury speedboat. And uh, they're already selling, I mean, they've sold hundreds of these things already, even though they've only started production. And uh, for like, you know, $300,000 speedboats, that's, I guess, a lot of boats because they don't just roll down an assembly line with people bolting on parts. Like these things are are fairly complicated to produce. So it, it's, it's cool to see the both the innovation and the um, sort of rapid development through the different models they've produced from the C7 that we tried last year to this new, um, it's almost like a cabin cruiser because it has a, you know, a cabin inside of it that you can go in and sleep inside of. And um, there's an option to even have a marine toilet in there. So just big innovation here, big, um, you know, updates and development to Candela's electric boats. And it's been just such a cool experience to, to test these things out and, experience what it's like to really fly on one of these electric boats. Yeah. And we, we talked about before, like, uh, because these are only like the, the resistance and the drag is only from the wing that's below the surface of the water. Um, they're quite a bit more efficient than, uh, the equivalent, uh, traditional hull boat. What, what is the amount of like energy savings typically? Um, so I can compare it to, uh, like an X shore, which is another Swedish electric boat. It's uh -huh. more of a typical V hole. And that one has like four times the battery in it. So okay. um, in terms of actual, like, you know, kilowatt hour per, per nautical mile or something, I'm not sure what X shores numbers are, but um, I can tell you that you use the same kilowatt hour per nautical mile. So like the same efficiency in the Candela C8 when you're going five knots or when you're going 20 knots. Okay. And when you're going five knots, you're like down in the water. Right. right. So, you basically you're going four times as fast and you're getting the exact same efficiency. Right. So that's a big deal. So, yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's huge. And there's only, I think it's like a 44 kilowatt hour battery, which is quite small when you think Relatively, about it, especially yeah. since, I mean, boats are not known for being super efficient. You, that's, you know, water is right. not a great medium to, to travel through in terms of, you know, energy usage. So that's a, a pretty small battery and they still get, um, you know, comparable range to other, electric boats. And I think compared to a lot of boats, they actually get, get longer range than other electric boats. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's pretty cool. Like, so, so like what's the downside? So there is some danger. Like if you hit a huge wave, what happens? So uh, if you hit something that it, it can't handle, which I think is over like um, a meter or almost a meter, like three feet or so, then basically it just lands and uh, landing. I mean, that's what they call it, but basically it just sort of re-enters the water uh -huh. and there's a bit of a splash but other than that it's like you just go back to being a normal boat which in terms of failure methods it's kind of like one of the most convenient failure methods it's like when an escalator stops working and it just becomes stairs like it's right pretty convenient yeah unless it like swallows you up or 
you know goes <laughs> goes backwards or something crazy. No, this is yeah, uh, it's a cool. It's such a cool technology. Um, I don't I don't know if we've talked about it before, but um, in when I used to live in Hong Kong, there was a uh, hydrofoil ferry to Macau that we would take, and you know I, I get kind of seasick on boats, especially if I'm like inside and not looking out. And this thing, you know, it was just straight flat. It felt like, as you say, it felt like flying or maybe even like more like a train almost um, because there was some, you know, connection to the ground. It wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, you know, when you're flying, you, you feel the wind, like turbulence and stuff. It was almost like less, less bouncy than flying. It's more like, uh, it's like hovering. A, yeah. Like on a, on a very smooth train or something. So I guess like, you know, the big question is like, this seems like the technology of the future, you know, what is holding everybody else up in getting these kind of things out? Yeah. At this point, I think it's, it's a combination of production and price. So the C8 is designed for more mass production where, whereas the C7, they were largely hand building them and it took forever because, you know, the hole was like 30 different carbon fiber pieces that all had to be joined. So this one, the, the hole, it's basically one large carbon fiber mold. Um, I mean, they're still, you know, in a sense, hand produced because that's how boats are, are built. You know, it's like mm -hmm. they, they sit on <laughs> big blocks and they get assembled by, by workers. It's not like, you know, in Detroit when these things are built by robots um, in like a car factory, but it's, it's designed to be more mass producible and they're selling hundreds. So they're going to be producing them much more quickly. But the other thing I think is just cost. This is a 300,000 plus dollar boat. And so, you know, obviously this is only for, for people that have that kind of, kind of boat money. But I right. think the, the really cool thing about Candela though, is that it's not just limited to basically rich people that want like a nicer boating experience. They're developing um, electric uh, water taxis and ferries. So as an actual, you know, like utility vehicle that is going to be used to replace diesel powered ferries and that, you know, us normal folks can use on a day to day basis, you're going to be able to take advantage of this Candela technology and have, just like you said, a more pleasurable ferry experience or, um, you know, quicker and more uh, energy efficient water taxis, especially in places like Stockholm, which is, you know, a great archipelago, but also, you know, in like the Bay Area or even in uh, New York City, you know, just taking like a water taxi across the rivers like this would be a very quick, efficient way to, to get around. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that was that was also the case in Hong Kong. Like, I'm sure these would be very popular in that area. All right. We have one last story uh, before we get to the, the comments. Uh, if if anybody wants us to talk about something, just throw it in the uh, either YouTube or Facebook comment section. Uh, but the last one is also probably the most popular, one of the most popular stories of the week on Electric. Last year, I bought a $2,000 electric mini pickup truck from China. Here's how it's holding up. So this has been a, a bit of a saga for me, you could say. Uh, I bought this thing from China after discovering it for my um, awesomely weird Alibaba electric vehicle of the week column. And I've had it now for almost a year and it's actually holding up quite well. And I feel like a lot of people are bothered by the fact that how well it's holding up because so many comments are people saying like, you know, oh, good thing it's got a bed and back so you can pick up all the pieces that fall off and, you know, that kind of thing, which... I get, I think there's, you know, some like xenophobia hidden in there that people think that you can't get good stuff made in China. But if anything, I'd say this has just proven how an inexpensive little electric vehicle used in a pretty tough, like, you know, work environment, which is my parents' ranch in Florida, is holding up great. So this thing, um, I mean, we use it all over the place. It's used for yard work. Um, it's used for um, taking runs uh, for, you know, all the trash to the dump. It's used... Um, for landscaping. Um, my dad moves like uh, building materials around in it. And so it's not like a, you know, pampered um, trailer queen kind of, kind of truck. Like, I mean, truck, it's like 11 feet long. We call it our truck, but um, you know, it's getting used hard and this thing is holding up really well. What I need is to put a, a bed liner in it because the, the bed is getting a little bit beaten up, you know, thin paint, that sort of thing. But otherwise, you know, the electric system, it's all doing well. Um, the, the body, it's like, it's not getting dented up. 
all the lights work great. Uh, my dad did break off one of the lights on the uh, roof rack going under a tree with some low hanging uh, branches. So we've got to um, fix the housing on one of the lights, but that's kind of our fault. Can't blame that one on the truck. But otherwise, I mean, the thing is just held up really well and hasn't given me any problems, which I was a little bit worried would be the case because with no you know, easily ob obtainable replacement parts in the U.S., there's, uh, you know, you got to be a little creative if something breaks to be able to fix it yourself. And so, so far I haven't had to get too creative, but uh, it's, it's really just been like a great little utility vehicle to have around the property and uh, has blown me away with, with how well it's held up. Yeah, we're looking at a, a, a Twitter video of um, it. It actually has a dump truck like function, um, and that that continues to work well. And it's like uh, it, it can. It looks like there's quite a bit of dirt in this thing right now. It it yeah, it, dumps like a truck. Dumps like a truck, huh? Because <laughs> you know, the, you look at the wheels and you're like, hmm, is that like a uh, that going to hold a lot of weight? Uh, it just like the proportions to me are still just a little bit weird. Yeah. The, um, in fact, that's one of the, the two upgrades that I'm planning to do. One is the wheels. So I've got new tires for it that are like ATV tires Okay. and, uh, they've got better tread. So right now it's got those urban tires on and uh -huh. they work, you know, fine, but it's, it's pretty sandy, um, sort of soil out there. And so a little tread would be better. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is I want to add a solar panel onto the roof rack. Oh, Cause neat. I think just even trickle charging it, like even a, I think I'm going to put a 50 watt panel on top okay. and it's not much, but you know, if you get, um, I don't know, like six or seven hours of sun a day, you can put 300 watt hours into the battery a day. Like that's a nice little trickle charge. And that might be, um, you know, seven, eight miles a day of, of range you can get out of, you know, a little panel. Yeah. And if nothing else, you know, you're at least your battery's not draining, you know, falling off at all. Um, exactly yeah and you use what kind of battery for this thing so this has a lithium iron phosphate battery it's six kilowatt hours it's actually the biggest battery they could put in it um, i had to pay extra for the big battery <laughs> and also to upgrade over the the lead acid because the the base model comes with lead acid so the truck itself was 2000 but it's um you know like all good toys batteries not included right um and so i paid about a thousand dollars for a six kilowatt hour lithium iron phosphate battery to uh to give it as much capacity as possible because i just figured like you're only getting a truck from china once might as well put the biggest battery in you can put yeah it's interesting um i had a gem for a while um and the the specs are kind of similar to to that the wheels were a little bit similar um i had a uh it had a you know a fake truck bed on the back didn't didn't uh dump or anything but um unfortunately those were lead acid batteries and we kind of left kind of left it out too long on in the on state so um that was unfortunate but um this size vehicle and especially at you know that price i i wonder if that's something that uh you know the vehicle companies are kind of overlooking like if you make it at a reasonable price if you make it you know semi uh you know high quality it like i wonder if there's there's a product market here like if, yeah. if, if you, if you imported a thousand of these, you think you'd be able to sell them at, you know, 5,000 each? Potentially. Yeah. I could see that being, uh, you know, maybe 6,000, you know, but I think that that price range would be reasonable if you're talking about a, a thousand vehicles. I mean, I a hundred percent agree with you that this is sort of an overlooked category in that, you know, this isn't going to replace an F-150 for a lot of people, but for sort of medium sized jobs, like the way we use it around the property, it's exactly what we need. And I mean, so many people were like, for that price, you can just buy a used, you know, F-150 kind of thing. But like, that's not what I want. Like, I don't want to have to deal with, you know, uh, going out and having to buy gas for the thing or, you know, dealing with like a transmission goes out. Like there's a lot of problems there. Right. And having a electric, low maintenance, simple, easy to use mini truck like this just solves so many problems. And, you know, I mean, imagine if this was a four seater that you could drive around the neighborhood, take your kids to the friend's house, take your kids to school. Yeah. You know, like, I mean, we're talking neighborhood electric vehicles, 25 miles an hour. That's enough for a lot of small local jobs. Now, is this uh, neighborhood electric vehicle compliant? Like, uh, could you get this certified or whatever? 
So unfortunately, no, it doesn't meet the um, the federal motor vehicle safety standards, which there, believe it or not, there are actually safety standards for uh, low speed vehicles or neighborhood electric vehicles. And this one, unfortunately, does not meet those. So um, I can't technically take it on the road, um, but theoretically, it could be produced to meet the federal motor vehicle safety standards if someone like, you know, started from with that as the the plan. But, you know, things like the glass doesn't meet code, the uh, seatbelts don't meet code, it doesn't have a VIN number, that kind of stuff. Okay. And isn't there something like it has to be made in a factory that's also like blessed yeah. by blessed by the U.S. something? Yeah, that's the uh, the VIN number magic because in order to have a VIN that actually like is found in the NHTSA database, the the factory has to be registered. And so, you know, like the whole car can have DOT seat belts, DOT glass, and everything, but if it doesn't have a VIN that that shows up in the uh, NHTSA database, then it's not you know, a street legal. So you got to like attack it from multiple angles, which can all be done, but you know, you really got to start from the beginning and say like, you know, I'm going to build a street legal for the U S neighborhood electric vehicle. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of frustrating because, uh, you know, Polaris, which owns gem makes vehicles similar to this. Maybe, you know, they over, they do a lot more, um, higher end stuff to it. But those also cost like twenty thousand dollars, and by the time it's twenty thousand dollars, you're like, well, I'll just, you know, I'll get a Chevy Bolt or whatever, or you know, Nissan Leaf or you know, something to that effect. Which is like, yeah, that's you know, that's going to be a lot better for for some of these tasks. Obviously, not dumping dirt in a leaf or anything, but it's just frustrating that there's nothing in like you can't get some, you can't buy a product like this in this you know under ten thousand dollar price range. Yeah, the, the price gap is just so huge. And I mean, you're exactly right. Like I was a while ago, I was on Gem's website because I was actually looking at it and and they started something like 12 or 13,000, which, you know, I was like, ah, it's, a, it's a bit much, but like maybe that's doable. Let me check it out. And you start like building it on their builder and it's like, oh, you want doors? That's like $1,500. And I'm like, oh, you want lithium batteries instead of lead right. acid? That's another $8,000. Yeah, the fact that they're still using... One, Lead acid batteries on at you know Gem is a little bit disappointing. I I feel like that era has already come and gone, and and the fact that they're still even offering that stuff is frustrating. Yeah, I think it's just to be able to give a a better entry level price because it's. I mean, I think it's seriously like five six thousand dollars is the difference in lead acid and lithium um, prices for Gem, and so it's a difference between saying it starts at twelve or it starts at seventeen or eighteen. Yeah. All right. Well, I I, uh, I continue to look forward to the updates on this thing. Um, maybe you can have like a pool contest with that tractor in the background there or something. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I, I'm trying to figure out what other kind of exciting adventures you can put put this thing through. So I towed my dad's uh, minivan with it and it really? actually worked. It's like a 4,000 pound minivan and uh, like not very far. You know, we just like hooked it up to see if it could do it. And we pulled it like 20 feet and it worked just fine. Interesting. So it does have some yeah. torque. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's not a toy. People think it's a golf cart, but it's a uh, you know powerful little vehicle. Cool. Well, uh, look forward to updates on that. Let's uh, jump into the comments here. Um, C. Ed says good morning. Uh, Mohit, I want a I want to buy a forty eight volt, fourteen amp hour battery. Where can I buy it without paying a hundred dollars shipping? Well, you can buy it. At probably like Amazon and eBay, but the shipping charges are probably going to be built in. What do you think? What's, what's your go-to place for bike batteries? Yeah. Um, I mean, probably my favorite e-bike battery vendor is a, a place called EM3 EV. It's a company in China started by a British expat. And so like super high quality batteries, but you're paying shipping anywhere unless like Seth said, if it's free shipping, then it's not really free. So I don't think you're getting away from that. All right. Uh, email. Go ahead and hit tips at or tip at Electrek if you want to reach us. Uh, he wants the battery to be safe and not explode. I think uh, your aforementioned vendor is good at that. Um, all right. We're just gonna kind of cycle through here. I think Dan Earl was talking about the uh, motorcycle. As long as you can press with the balls of your feet. 
or was that? I think that was the high heels on the uh, bike. Oh, right. I think that's what that was. Yeah. Okay. And then kind of just some communications. Uh, Solar Adam says, nice golf cart. I think he's referring not to your Explorer, but to the... Um, I think it was the Nimbus, right? The Nimbus, yeah. Uh, it seems like before he's kind of a motorcycle guy, so maybe that's why. Uh, regarding Saunders, uh, MDC Forerunner says, I'm looking at an email from yesterday with a full nine of them in crates. Slowest <laughs> ramp ever. Uh, do you have any uh, of your own up- updates on on Saunders? Um, I haven't seen the email with the nine of them. The last update I got was, it was very cryptic. They shared, uh, I think it was on Instagram, a uh, an image of a container ship or like a bunch of containers in port actually which and port? everyone was like yeah that's a good question i think it was uh in la okay and i think it was like long beach and so uh and a lot of people are like what the heck these were supposed to be like in your warehouse months ago and now you're showing us a picture of the port so uh you know it, it sounds like they might have nine of them out of the box so far okay so congratulations to the first nine pre-orders yeah if you woke up early that morning and ordered congratulations <laughs> All right, Nimbus, that uh, 193X to 195X Danish build motorbike. Uh, Not following. Yeah, I must have really lost that one. Uh, Solar Adam, what is good resources for newcomers to e-bike hub motors? I've got geared hub motor and one more speed for my commute. Thanks. What do you think? Um, So the shortcut to more speed is always more voltage, but that's a dangerous game. So... Um, you know, if you've got like a 36 volt e-bike, just overvolt that sucker and you'll go faster. But, uh, just like with Seth's, uh, Luna X2, like we've discovered if, you know, you overvolt or overpower these things too much, you start getting overheating issues. So yeah, you gotta be careful when you start pushing the envelope. Yep. All right. So that's all the comments for today. Take us out. All right. Well, Thank you guys, everyone, for tuning in and make sure you come back two weeks from today where we'll be back with another episode of the Wheelie Podcast. Take care, everybody.